Bonjour, bonsoir. How are you, dear friends? We are building the most inspiring and phenomenal communities of wine lovers. As we all know, wine is the catalyst of the greatest discussion. We'll be talking wine, but of course food, and everything that touches all our nation and senses. Bonjour, bonsoir, dear friends. Happy hour. And I'm so sorry for yesterday. The fabulous Facebook algorithm intervened with the fermentation art of what happened in the wine country. So we had to revisit the absolute happy hour with the phenomenal Marnie Old, the lady with whom I had the pleasure to bring velvet to your life, emotion, feel, and touch. Whether it goes to my heart, I have two, as you know, on the right, and on the left, it still speak for passion for wine. So, dear friends, we're going to have a great topic of discussions tonight, a very, very important one, talking about ripeness and the world of ripeness between two continents, America and Burgundy. But to bring the fabulous educator, the ladies who run our Vin Enlightenment, Marnie Old, co-author of our book and one of the most amazing summary of America, I need to traditionally, and we have guests tonight, we have great friends who visited us, they're going to catch the cork in their mouth or in their cleavage. Ah! Whichever. Where did it go? In the mouth. Dear friends, JCB69, again, was the actor of the night, provoked discussions, and encouraged emotions. So, Marnie, welcome tonight to this amazing moment together, as always. Welcome to Marnie Old. It's an amazing opportunity for us to enjoy the same wine from coast to coast, west coast to east coast. We're going to have a fantastic time tonight. And of course, you know, what I love about this wine is not just that, you know, you were born in 69, I was born in 69, but to me, this wine always reminds me that Agent 69 is your alter ego. I'm laying like 69. I'm feeling you, Marnie, in blue. There's a little white marble, <laughs> and I'm wearing red. Together it's we are very Montreal today. So, Marnie, <laughs> talking about 69, how does it feel for you to be born in 1969? You know, I was always someone who felt so lucky to have squeaked into the 60s by the skin of my teeth because I'm like you, a September baby and a Virgo, I believe. Is that correct? Well, in any case, I am a Sagittarius. I'm still a Virgo, of course. November, right? A few, few more weeks in my mother's belly and I would have been born in 1970. And I'm sorry, but I am just not a child of the 70s. I am... I have a deep resonance in my core with the 60s. So the fact that I was able to get 1969 onto my birth certificate, onto my passport, onto my driver's license, I, I just think it's the coolest thing ever. And, you know, you fit the 60s so much. And <laughs> I cannot stop remembering how great it was at my birthday. You had that magical purse and those beautiful, lovely guns, and you were feeding us the JCB 69 with another ingredient. What was that? You said to everybody, I'm born in 69 to open your mouth. And what I did made you a start? cocktail that was based on the JCB distilled spirit, the gin, and included the JCB 69 and a little, just faint hint of vermouth. That was so fantastic. I need the recipe. You left me the beautiful golden gun you used all night, and I've used it a few times, and I've used it for my birthday in your honor, and I want to thank you so much for that because that's the best way to, 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 to shoot a little bit of your spirits to someone. No pun intended. Yes, yes and contact-free in our socially distanced world. That's right. So, Marnie, 
As we're going to talk about a great topic, uh, I want the world to continuously know that you're an amazing educator, you're an amazing wine personality, incredible sommelier, a phenomenal writer, and I want the world to know that this gorgeous, oh, ooh, new cover of our book together, and we've changed our cover. We're not even on the we, cover anymore. Well, we on the I back. Old cover, which has you and I together. We had a great day, which is right near that piano behind you. Actually, we were having a fantastic Monday morning dance party for our cover shoot that day. But I do think that the change of the cover and that velvet slip cover is going to make this an amazing gift for the holidays this year. And I know ambassadors are super excited about that. Well, congratulations. I love the cover. I love as well the idea for people, and I think as we're going to start tonight, maybe more of a lecture that I would love for you to give to all our guests and friends. I love for people to be able to play with this as they really understand fine wines. And I'm trying to get Dylan's attention to zoom in because he's doing two things Sorry, at once. There's a whole bunch of people. Wondering what and this is the exciting time where everybody needs to understand that everything they find around them is good to describe wine. It could be feathers, it could be texture, it could be fruit, it could be vegetables, it could be herbs, it could be anything. I love that cover because it encourages us to use the world around us to describe wine. Don't you think? Absolutely. And, and the thing that I love about this book project that you and I embarked on together, Jean-Charles, is that it is, I, I've read a lot of wine books. I was a sommelier in the fine dining world for years, teaching for the French Culinary Institute. And there are so few wine books that actually get down to the nitty gritty, that really break it down and get you to the core of what actually matters in the world of wine. And of course, sensation and the sensory variety that we find in wine is one of them. That's what's depicted on the cover. But the other aspect, the thing that I get the most feedback about this book of all time is that one central concept that you and I use to explain yeah. our spectrum of style, the concept of ripeness. Yes. So Marnie, we're going to be obviously diving into this, but before we do, I would love if you can explain the mouth to everyone. Sure. So there's one page in the book, dear friends, I love the most. I talk about it virtually every day. You know, <laughs> I use my tongue for a lot of things. My favorite way to use it is for kissing. Of course. <laughs> you know, when I was allowed to kiss the world and the world was allowed to receive my energy in that figuratively sense, I used to always describe the way you actually drew the tongue in one of the pages of the book. So explain that to all of us before we dive into rightness, because I think it's going to explain a lot of it. Well, and it, it helps so much to understand that when we as professionals taste wine, we're using each one of our sensory channels separately. So there are five senses that we use, of course. One of them is less important with wine analysis and more important with wine appreciation, which is the resonance of sound. But when it comes to tasting wine, we appreciate the wine first with the eye. That's where we take in its energy first. But once you put wine in your mouth, there are three senses that are engaged all at the same time. And we often just refer to this in the colloquial English, English language as wine tasting. But it's not just tasting, it's wine tasting and wine smelling and wine feeling all at the same time. Because we have three different senses engaged every time we take a sip of wine. First, the wine contact, well, let's ex use the 69 as an example. First, the wine contacts the taste buds. And there are only a limited number of things that your tongue can detect in wine. Really, there's only two of dramatic significance, acidity and sweetness, and every other thing that the tongue can detect on contact, which could be saltiness or bitterness or umami or fat, those aren't major components in wine. It's the sweetness and acidity that we feel on contact. 
And yeah. almost everything else that we think of as flavor that happens in the mouth is actually technically being detected by your sense of smell, the olfactory nerves behind your nose, behind the sinus cavities. And it's actually the action of taking the wine into your mouth, allowing it to warm with body heat and send its vapors up the retronasal passage that allows us to smell the wine more dramatically, more vividly. So are you saying that part on the back of the tongue? Ritual exactly. fashion, right? That's exactly. the key. So when you all, dear friends and Dylan, you're behind the camera and you're tasting wine, get more wine and get it to breathe through the back of your mouth. And Dylan, in this bottle, we have a lot of great guests tonight. So fill their glasses, get the ladies excited with the flavor. We can hear the sound. Jen Lombard is very agitated as always <laughs> and drinking a lot of the wines. But I think, ladies, don't you feel it? Oh my God. It's amazing because, and with the bubbles coming in, and I think it's called retro olfaction. And I think it's a very important part. Maybe Dylan, you need some too. Dylan needs wine, oh ladies and gentlemen, always. He's still a bachelor, although we don't know. There's a lot of secret in Dylan's life that we're trying to unveil. We never know, but soon we will tell you more to the story. I know there's a lot of people in the chat. Where is Dylan? Who is he dating? Is he available? Is Jen available? Is Jen and Dylan dating together? There's a lot of miracles that are happening in Napa. Maybe they did in April. Maybe they stopped in May. Maybe they started again in, in June. Who knows? We will never know unless we get them on the show. Because I believe besides tasting wine, Marnie, we're going to have to know the true story of what happened in the camera when it was very stormy in April. We were all gathering and having those sessions. And suddenly I could see Dylan saying to Jen, can I drive you home? It's stormy outside. There's a lot of hail. I don't want you to be scared. And they took all the wines at the tasting and suddenly they disappeared in the clouds of Napa Valley and maybe the Russian River. Well, I have to we always surrounded with the Russian. So. Emotions were very intense in April, so that wouldn't surprise me in this life. Me too. I really want to know the truth because they both got transformed. Their sense of taste become so much enlightened that something Marnie must have happened with her mouth, their sense of touch, their well, sense of I, I intertwining each other. That might be my fault. I did share my famous margarita recipe in April. Oh, <laughs> I think Dylan is saying, yes, ma'am. <laughs> so I think, Marnie, we got to start. I think what would be really fun is to start your enlightenment on rightness with the Russians. Sure. Because Absolutely. we know... I know you have guests. And I know you have They are from Russia, of all things. Around you. And they are so all around you. us. We are receiving yes. today, this is why I have my red jacket, in honor of the red square of Moscow. The square that I've walked sideways. You are looking red today, which is why I decided to go blue. And oh, in any I, case, what well. we're going to do is we're going to have people pour the next wine for themselves, which is the Jean-Charles Boisse Bourgogne Pinot Noir. I see you okay, already have it in your French. glass. We'll start and French so and go Russian. That's how it happens, typically. <laughs> and what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen, and we are going to talk about something that is really a central concept in our book, and that is that there's one key concept that explains so incredibly so much about wine. It makes so much sense. It's so in intuitive that it can instantly turn a beginner, a novice in wine into someone who feels like an expert almost immediately. And that's what's so powerful about the Passion for Wine book. And that concept, the powerful idea behind it is the concept of the ripeness spectrum. The idea that not all grapes that are used to make wine are equally ripe and that that ends up controlling so many of the flavor properties and traits that we consider to be essential when deciding what to drink with what food, what style is going to work best in the summer versus the winter and so on. 
So let's just talk about these three wines. We've already tasted the JCB number 69, a sparkling Pinot Noir from northern regions within the Burgundy zone of France. And then the wine that you now have in your glass is a Bourgogne Pinot Noir, also 100% Pinot Noir, but radically different in style. It is a red wine that we call a Bourgogne Pinot Noir from the eponymous house of Boisset, the founding family winery, Jean-Claude Boisset. It's the one we call Les Ursulines, that we are proud to showcase because it is named for the Ursuline nunnery, which is the foundation of the entire estate. This is where the winemaking takes place. And then finally, we will end in a California Pinot Noir from Deloche, the very first of the wineries that was purchased by the Boisset family in North America. And that is a unique cuvee, the one we call the Anderson Valley Pinot Noir. And I chose it for a very specific reason that you'll see in a moment. So the underlying concept of ripeness is the underlying concept behind our Boisset spectrum of style, which many of you might already be familiar with. But ripening is the process, it's, it's a biological process during which fruit becomes ready to eat. And as fruit ripens, it gets sweeter and grows softer and changes color, something that we all know from picking berries in the backyard or, you know, your garden. Tomatoes on the vine do the exact same thing. And ripeness is completely intuitive just because of that. Just looking at fruit or vegetables can tell us how it will taste. And not just how it will taste, it can get a, give us a sense of how it will smell and even how it will feel in the mouth when we bite into it. Look at those tomatoes in the top left corner. You just just know they'll be juicy enough to run down the chin when you give it a bite right through the skin. Now ripeness can change flavor in predictable ways and those predictable ways are tremendously useful to winemakers because they shape the range of flavor possibilities regardless of which grape variety you happen to be growing. So there's a, a, there's a mistaken idea in the world of wine that grape variety alone tells you what the wine will taste like, a, a direct connection like ice cream, like vanilla is vanilla and chocolate is chocolate. No, 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 no. Pinot Noir is not just Pinot Noir. Cabernet Sauvignon is not just Cabernet Sauvignon, they each have a range of flavored possibilities that will vary based on the degree of ripeness of the grapes. Since ripeness is central to many wine style distinctions, and that's exactly why we're tasting these three wines today, because they give us as dramatic a contrast as we could manage within the Boisset portfolio to show you low ripeness, medium ripeness, and high ripeness within one single grape variety. And these are characteristics that are consistent in the world. We know that as fruit ripens, it gets less acidic. It starts tasting less green over time. We know that its sweetness grows stronger with ripeness. Skin color darkens with ripeness. We know that fruit flavors develop with ripeness and spice flavors and all sorts of nuances and layers of flavor develop with sunshine as well. Essentially, winemakers pick their grapes earlier to preserve acidity and suppress alcohol when they're trying to make lighter wines like our JCB 69. So as you can imagine with a sparkling rosé, those grapes were harvested as early as possible to make for the lightest, most refreshing wine style. Whereas if you want to let the grapes hang longer on the vine, they will develop more sugar content, which makes them feel heavier in the mouth once you ferment them into wine and gives them deeper, darker flavors and more concentration. All of this leads to a heavier style of wine because we've boosted the alcohol as well as the flavor development possible in the skins of the grapes. And this gives us more color, more flavor, more oomph at the end of the day. So let's think about this. Let's, let's give a, a blueberry analogy to our Pinot Noir grapes here tonight. When Pinot Noir grapes are barely ripe, when they're still just green and just barely starting to pick up that purple color of ripeness, they are very high in acidity at that stage. And that's exactly what we need for making a sparkling wine like the JCB 69. So when we make a champagne method sparkling wine, we're harvesting our grapes at a stage that is barely ripe in terms of the ripeness you would want for eating the fruit raw, the ripeness that you would want for making a red wine, certainly. And as fruit ripens, we know 
it gets sweeter, it grows softer, it gets juicier, it changes color. And this is exactly what we need when we want to move into making a red wine style. And the wine in your glass right now, the Bourgogne Pinot Noir from Jean-Claude Boisset, this is a style that is very dry, quite tart and acidic. Still, it has plenty of acidity, not quite as high as the bubbles, but still quite sharp. But it is a very food-oriented style of wine. This is a, a level of ripeness that is balanced in the sense that it has some of the dark skin color and rich sweetness of the very ripest blueberries, but also some of the bright tanginess and the snappy acidity and earthy green herbal flavors of the lower ripeness blueberries. And this is the magic of the wine world. This is what becomes so important because warmer areas, if you plant the same grape, Pinot Noir, in a warmer zone, that boosts the potential ripeness and allows you to harvest darker, sweeter fruit, which makes darker, more intensely flavored, fuller bodied wines. That stronger, fuller bodied and fruitier, richer texture is something that we associate with warmer climates when it comes to growing a grape like Pinot Noir, what you have in your glass right now. In fact, I'm gonna switch right now to the Anderson Valley from Deloche because this is the one that is fuller bodied, that is fruitier, that is richer in texture. and and honestly, on the nose, it smells more dessert-like. It has more layered dark fruits as well, which isn't all that surprising because we're moving towards the high end of the ripeness spectrum. At low ripeness, that's where we make our sparkling wines. At medium ripeness, this is what we find what in the cooler climate ah! European zone. And when we move to the higher end of the ripeness scale, and hello, clocking in at 15% alcohol. This Pinot Noir from Anderson Valley is one of the beastiest of the bunch that we have in our Boisse collection portfolio. And that's why I wanted to share it with you today to illustrate the concept of ripeness, Jean-Charles. And I love this idea of ripeness. You touch on so many phenomenal topics. I'm out of breath. And out of even words, Marnie, so impressed I am of this explanation, but so important. And I would like to say this wine tastes marvelous. So from the tasting of this wine to the ripeness to the next wine, Marnie, guide us. Keep going because it's so good. Oh, absolutely. Well, just think about, I, I mean, I happen to be in a part of the country where the tomatoes are just ripening now. And so if really? you take the tomato before it's fully ripe, yes, in fact, we are just getting oh. our heirloom tomatoes now. I know. <laughs> this is a cold part of the world. In any case, the tomatoes, if you pick them earlier, they taste more green and leafy and herbal. If you pick them later, they start tasting more tomato-like. They start developing more sweetness. They get darker in their flesh. They get juicier and so on. And that's exactly the shift. When you taste these two Pinot Noir red wines side by side, I do know that the JCB 69 tastes like a completely different planet, a different universe away because yep. it is made in a wildly different style. But the two red wines, both of these, 100% Pinot Noir, both of these are made with very similar winemaking techniques. The difference comes that the Bourgogne Pinot Noir from northern France is grown in a cooler, cloudier climate where the grapes take a longer time to ripen. And so when we harvest them in the fall, they have not yet given up all of their leafiness, that herbal quality of taste. They have not yet given up their minerality, their earthiness. They have not yet given up their sharpness and acidity. And that's why that Bourgogne Pinot Noir has that zing. It has that cranberry, that pomegranate tartness yep. quality to it that we so love as a food partner. This is something that can sometimes be a little, um, you know, for Americans in particular who've grown up cutting their teeth on California wines, a Bourgogne Pinot Noir can... <laughs> Yes, be like mother's milk to you, Jean-Charles, but oh, it can be an acquired taste for Americans. The next nipple of my life, the nipple of Burgundy. <laughs> well, I love it because I think you, you've touched on, on many phenomenal points, Marnie, and I want to engage all our friends with us tonight to think about that tomato you just talked about, to think about the every vegetable, every fruit, every herb they think about and they stop and think and reflect. And I think that's what life is about in general. And as we compare the Burgundy planted really 11 centuries ago to 
the fabulous Anderson Valley Pinot Noir, but really Russian River Bays de Loach, when the Russian came in 1812, and really were thinking about trapping beautiful skins to send back to Russia via Alaska, or selling it to the Hudson Valley Company in Canada, one of the first retail ever in history, they were already thinking about wine and great wine. And I think what is interesting is we thought ripeness will never come in the Russian River, or some parts of Burgundy will never come as far as ripeness, and here it is. And I think it's so important, dear friends, as you cook, as you prepare dishes, as you think about anything you do in life, there's a right moment for it. And there's the true moment for it. And I'm very excited, Marnie, as we taste this, the Loach Pinot. Tell us what you think about it in comparison to the French Burgundy wine and how they both, on top of one another, you selected the wine. Did you mean 69 should be the theme between the Russian River and the French, and we should try to create some love with one another? And they, oh, oh yeah, the yeah. Franco American love Noise, is one excitement. of our for all of our tastings, personally. But this is, uh, to me, I find, you know, I, I come from a wine education background. But even when I was a sommelier, the thing that I enjoyed most about my work was to try and help explain the complexities of wine to my servers and bartenders so that they could then explain it to their customers and so on. And for me, I think that might be in part because my dad was a geography professor and my mom was a kindergarten teacher. And together, somehow I inherited That's that explaining crazy. gene. So... For me, when I chose this, the idea of tasting one grape variety executed in three wildly different styles. I mean, this JCB 69, delicate, effervescent, just vivacious in style. The Bourgogne Pinot Noir, one of the lighter Pinot Noirs in our portfolio. It has so much refreshment. It can cross over into seafood or vegetarian cuisine in a flash. It is designed to be able to be almost more flexible than any other single wine in our entire portfolio. Although watch out with sugar and spice. It does not like sugar and spice. It is delicious with Mediterranean or California flavors, vegetables, herbs, and so on, and cheeses to die for. But this Anderson Valley Pinot Noir, there's a reason I chose this from Deloche. As as you know, our Deloche Pinot Noirs tend, as a rule, to be our more delicate, our more Burgundian, our more French-inspired styles of Pinot Noir, but I wanted one that flirted with the traditional California approach to Pinot Noir, which is often to allow it to ripen further, to get sweeter on the vine, to hang longer on the vine than you would in Burgundy, and this Anderson Valley Mendocino Pinot Noir because, okay, so Anderson Valley is the very next valley up the coast from Russian River. It has quite a bit in common, but this vineyard is a little sheltered. That's one of the reasons it's a bit of a sun trap. It's tilted towards the sun. You get exceptional ripeness, and that's mm. one of the reasons we have darker colors. Yeah, we've shifted away from red fruit like strawberries and cranberries and pomegranates and start moving towards black cherries and black raspberries. There's more darkness. There's even more visible color. Literally, you can see in the glass that the grapes got riper in wine number three than they did in wine number two. And for me, I just remember back to when I was a, a young waitress at the Four Seasons Philadelphia, Jean-Charles, and Kevin Zraeli came down and was teaching wine classes. For me, the, the most explosive moment of like, aha, was when we tasted Chardonnays, another of your favorite grapes, Chardonnays from different regions of different ages and at different quality levels. And I was just gobsmacked that one grape variety could taste so wildly different. And to this day, the concept of ripeness, distinguishing style from one another has been central to the way that I teach and explain wine ever since. Marnie, you said it all, as always, magnificently well. And dear friends, it's amazing to be able to see Marnie being able to be amazing in a book as you read her words, as well as you hear her words. And Marnie, I really want to thank you tonight for bringing to everybody's attention rightness which is so important to bring to everybody's attention, flavor profile, evolution of wine throughout times, and obviously the technical side behind it, because we have a phenomenal savvy 
audience who want to learn, who want to know, and who want to be able for themselves to interpret wine. So, dear friends, it was so much fun to be together. We love bring Marnie on the JCB Live. She is fresh, exciting, vibrant. I hope the blue is no color to political statement because we didn't match it or we didn't plan it. Blue doesn't mean she's X and red doesn't mean I'm Y. It has nothing no. to do with it. It's just the colors of wine as they become I white. wanted something primary and primal and I knew you would be in red tonight. So I thought that it would be a little odd for us both to be across the country red on red. So I decided to go a little Mondrian. We, we just need some yellow in our mix today and we'll be perfectly balanced. So dear friends, if you want the passion for wine, the fantastic collection with velvet, there's only 500 limited edition. There's 300 left. So you could still get it for Thanksgiving or Christmas for your friends. And we cannot wait for you to compare really Burgundy, a very classical style to a Russian Valley influence Anderson Valley wine from the Lodge Vineyards and of course, Start and finish your day with JCB69. Whether you want to be on top or under, it's immaterial. Have a good time both ways.